Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. I am your host, Joanne Crone, joined here by my uh, deep purple hair co-host, Bree Tucker. Why, hello, hello, everybody. How are you? And since we're on YouTube now, you can actually go and see Bree's deep purple hair that she is spawning right now. It's going to be, it's going to be teal soon. Uh, Sometimes I wish I would dye my hair, but at the same time, I'm like, I would dye it and then I'd be like, I don't like it. It's, this this is not permanent. You Mm -hmm. know that about me. I changed my mind a lot too. And, And if you guys didn't get that slight hint, we are on YouTube now. Yes. We are on YouTube. Yes. Go to the No Guilt Mom YouTube channel. Just search No Guilt Mom. And if you really want to see mine and Bree's beautiful faces, which I know you do. Yes. <laughs> you and go, our festive hair. And our festive <laughs> hair. Go watch us on YouTube. But today we have a fantastic episode. Oh, I'm so excited. Lisa Lewis. She is a parenting journalist and author of the book, The Sleep Deprived Teen. We both have one of those, yep. probably. Two of them I on your... Two. I yep. think I have two, yeah. And Lisa focuses on the intersection of parenting, public health, and education. And she helped spark California's landmark healthy school start times law, which if you don't know about it, California just put into practice this year that no schools are allowed to start until after 830, no high schools anyways. Yeah. Which I think is a huge, huge thing, but it's we'll huge. Let you, we'll let you listen to the episode and then tell us what you think at the end. So we hope you enjoy this conversation with Lisa Lewis. Welcome Lisa to the No Guilt Mom podcast. We are so, so excited to have you with us today. And I was like devouring your book yesterday. And so I am super, super pumped for this conversation. So welcome. Oh, thank you. And I'm so glad to hear you're enjoying the book. Oh, sleep is like an issue. Like I feel so strongly about, and I feel like I'm fighting my family about all the time. I so. Think so many of us are like, we were just talking before this about how like sleep is definitely villainized. I feel like in our society, it's seen Absolutely. as a weakness. I was just talking to Bree that I remember probably in People magazine, an article I read that the presidents were touting how much sleep they got. And President Clinton was like, I get four hours of sleep. And then George W. Bush, they looked at his and he got seven to eight hours. And therefore he was a wimp because he didn't need as much sleep as that. more sleep, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) and it's ridiculous. It really is. Yeah, you know, as one of the, it's one of the things I did, obviously, when I was writing this book was talk to so many different sleep experts around the country. And one of them has such a great analogy that he uses, which is you wouldn't brag about how little air you breathe. You know, I mean, it's like, that's, why do people brag about how little sleep they get by it? It's not, that's a fantastic point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something we need to survive. <laughs> it is so essential. And what I find fascinating about your story is how you led a law being passed. You, you were part of the, the group who got a law passed in California to extend the school start time so that schools started later in the state and had to start later in the state. And I am so fascinated to dig in that story. Can you tell us a little bit about what led you to being involved in this? And you mentioned a story about seeing your son in the car. Yes. So I am a parenting journalist and I'm also a parent. I have two kids. They're now 21 and 17. And so my involvement in this issue began when my son, my oldest child, was just entering high school. So this was back in 2015. And I have been immersed in this issue since then. So the last seven years. But that was 2015 was the start of his high school years. So August of 2015, all of a sudden he's starting at a you know, brand new school because you, know, you, you move on up through the levels. And at that point, our local public high school started at 7.30 in the morning. Same, was, same. Oh, yeah. Oh, my I goodness. dropped my kid off at 6.30. Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That, I, I'm sorry, but that's sort of cruel for them to, mm-hmm. to be there that early. So it in is. our case, it was not quite that early. We were leaving the house at 7.10 every morning. I was driving him there. Um, but it was the earliest of all the levels of school in, in our district. And it was, you know, the earliest he'd ever had to go to school. And it was very obvious that this was not an optimal time for him. You know, he was there in the car, physically present, but hardly alert and ready to drop off where I could say confidently, you know, great, he's alert, ready for a full day of learning. Because he wasn't, he was, you know, kind of half asleep. So, of course, I started digging and trying to, you know, gather more information, trying to figure out why does our school start so early? And I quickly found out several things. The first was that this 7.30 start time had been entrenched for years. It went back decades. 
There was not anybody in town who could remember a time when it hadn't started so early. I mean, there were parents who had graduated from high school locally and said, oh yeah, it was 7.30 even when I went. Mm -hmm. But I also found out it wasn't just our community. This was the situation in so many communities around the country. Like you mentioned, you guys have a 7.30 start time. And would you believe 7.30 is not even the earliest start time out there. There are schools at 7 which I and believe that's it. Ma- I've, yeah. mm-hmm. And that's mandatory first period God. attendance. That's not I those can't get anywhere at 7 a.m. I cannot get somewhere at 7 a.m. And I'm supposed to have all these extra skills above my teenager. <laughs> well, and not only that, these, you know, when you when you talk about it, the starting time at 7 a.m., that's mandatory. That's you must be sitting in your seat for first period or you are marked absent or prevent. And it's so interesting about this early start time because you you bring this up in a community and automatically it's pushed back and be like, well, this is how it is. And then, oh, bus schedules. That seems to always be the reason that That's high schools have to start so early. Is it bus schedules? Oh. That's what I always thought it was. I always thought it was a matter of like just having to get the bus to the right places at the right time. Well, you know, that is actually what has been the driver behind so many of these early schedules. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what I found, you know, when I did some more digging was schools, even though in my community, the 730 time had been in place for decades, it wasn't always that way. So it turned out that high schools way back when used to start closer to about nine o'clock in the morning. But these times gradually drifted earlier to the times we have now. And it driven in large part by the school bus system, the the school Mm -hmm. transportation system, because a couple factors played in. One was suburbanization because there used to be smaller neighborhood schools, and then there was a movement to consolidate Mm -hmm. into larger schools. And then, you know, they they started using buses to get kids to school, and then they wanted to save money on their, their transportation budget. So they started looking at using one fleet of buses that they could do for elementary, middle, and high and just do staggered times for the drop-offs and then the Mm pickups. But when they did that, this was before the research into adolescent sleep was widely known. So Mm -hmm. oftentimes by default, they put the oldest kids in those earliest time slots thinking, oh, well, they're older. They should be able to handle that. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, we know that is not the case. And we can talk more a bit later on about, you know, the fact that teens have a later sleep schedule But so the quick answer is, yes, it was driven by bus schedules. And even though we now know that the teens should not be going to school that early, these legacy schedules have endured. Okay. I'm just going to say, whoever thought that the teenagers could handle the earliest time clearly did not have a young child because you show me any kid that is like, I don't know, kindergarten that sleeps past 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. They were like up at the crack of dawn, like bouncing and ready to go. They could have handled it very well. They are the ones. They are the ones. Yeah. And we see this as parents. You just see this in your household. Your kids, when they're young, bounce out of bed. They're super Mm -hmm. happy and chipper and ready to go, you know, seize the day. Mm -hmm. Much more so than adults often. Yeah. Much more so than our teens. But it it turns out there's a biological reason for that. So one of the misconceptions out there is, oh, well, teens are just lazy. They just need to, you know, get up early. That is something that you hear a lot. You're like, we need to enforce a stronger work ethic in our teens. And it's... Mm -mm. Oh, I I still get that question regularly. You know, well, teens are so tired. You know, they should just go to bed earlier. They should just get up earlier. So, So I'll give you the quick background on that, which is that when our kids hit the teen years, there is actually a shift in their sleep schedules. And it, it's a, called a circadian rhythm shift. And this is driven by a timing delay in the release of melatonin. So melatonin is the hormone that primes us to start feeling sleepy. And so as our kids hit adolescence, that begins to shift to a later schedule. And so it's not released as early in the evening as it used to be. And it doesn't subside until later in the morning. So that means our teens are not feeling sleepy until about 11 o'clock at night, unlike our little kids, but also they're not feeling ready to wake as early in the morning as they used to. Mm -hmm. So, and and the other key piece is that our teens, of course, are still growing, you know, especially by the time they're they're juniors or seniors in high school, they look like adults in many cases, Mm -hmm. but they're not. They are still going through so much development and they need more sleep than we do as adults because of that. So yes, 
till age 18, they should still be getting eight to 10 hours of sleep every single night. So then you just do the math and you can see why those really early start times are making it almost impossible for them to get enough sleep. Absolutely. Yeah. And you dug into all this research and you wrote an op-ed in the local paper. Tell us what happened after you wrote the op-ed. Yeah, yeah. So it was a bit of a of a whirlwind. I mean, I certainly would not have predicted it at the outset. Because as a writer, you know, you gather information and you write about something, you put it out in the world and you never really know, you know, sometimes what the impact will be. But in this case, I was writing this again back in 2015 was when I really had gotten into the issue. The issue itself had hit a critical mass, I should just mention, because the previous year, the American Academy of Pediatrics had released its policy statement that no, middle and high school should not be starting so early, that 8.30 or later was the recommendation because the impact that these really early start times have on our teen sleep and therefore on their health mm. and well-being. So I start writing about all this. Um, my first article started coming out the spring of my son's freshman year, but there was one article that ran September of 2016. So this is his sophomore year. It was an op-ed that ran in the Los Angeles Times. It was called, Why School Should Start Later in the Day. That ended up being read by one of our California state senators. So he literally read it in the paper and his district is in Los Angeles. He had a high schooler of his own at that point and her high school was in the midst of discussions about start times. So he read my op-ed, it really resonated with him. He decided he wanted to look into the issue further with an eye towards introducing a bill on this. And that is exactly what happened. I got looped in because as part of my whole information gathering, you know, to write about it, I had been also looking at, well, gee, I think I want to try and make a change locally here and be an advocate. So I've started a chapter of a group called Start School Later, which was a, re a resource I had come across. Well, his office also found this resource. They're a terrific group, nonprofit. Um, they've been around since 2011. And they looped in all of us who were chapter leaders in the state of California. So I was involved even before the bill was officially introduced. And then it just snowballed from there. I ended up testifying at the state capitol. I was heavily involved throughout this whole process. And I won't bore you with all the details, but I'll just say I had never been you know, involved up close and personal in the political yeah. process before. And it was so eye-opening. That's um, interesting. And the, the bill was signed by Gavin Newsom and it just went into effect this year, correct? Exactly. So finally signed 2019 three year implementation window because you know communities need enough time to prepare. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you're right, it just went into effect in July in time for this for this school year. And we are the only state, California, as of this point, that has a law that states, you know, the earliest times that, that middle and high schools are allowed to start. And it's 830, right? That's the time. It is 8.30 or later for high schools. The law as passed ended up being 8 o'clock or later for middle schools. That was an adjustment that happened as part of the political process, in part to address some of the concerns that were coming up about transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, but again, the law is 8 or later, the hope being, of course, that, you know, it later. it's later. later. Yeah. yeah. And yet, even so, this is the first law that sets any kind of a, of a time. So um, so still a, a huge, huge win. No, I'm going to say, I remember I, I read an article not very long ago about some people that were pushing back against the law and saying how it was difficult to get transportation, getting their kids to school, getting to work and everything. And it's very interesting reading it because these are people that had opinions and I want to say the article was like August or September. So it hadn't been in, in place very long. Their school had like literally just done the change. And I yeah. just think it's a, it's an example of how difficult change can be. We joke around here that I'm def I'm like, Brie, don't move my cheese, Brie. <laughs> like I just, <laughs> I like things set the way they are and I don't like change a whole lot. But it, at, from the developmental side, I'm just like, just give it some time, guys. Like, it, you know, once you've got a chance to to react to it, things are going to change naturally in your life. Your work, you're probably going to have like a change in your start time where you'll talk to your, your boss about coming in at a different time because you have a different lifestyle now. And the more people that are doing that, the more common it's going to become. Mm -hmm. So the, the pushback that I hear from people, at least in my mind, the pushback that I hear about, oh, it doesn't work because I have to get to work and now I can't drive my kid to school, blah, blah, blah. Not to disregard it. Sorry about the blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> give it time and the society will catch up to that. We will, we will get there and, and get caught up and it'll be a regular expectation, but we're just not quite there yet. 
So yeah, no, it's you're so right. Um, there because these changes are not happening in a vacuum. Um, you know, there are these these other sort of ripple effects. So so that was in part why there was a three year implementation window here in California. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. just you know what you bring up the the natural kind of resistance to change is so real, and in part that's because the current schedules are not family friendly. You know, mm -hmm. it, when it yeah. talks about change as being inconvenient, well, already what we have is inconvenient. And we've had to sort of cobble together these wraparound schedules. I mean, our lives as parents, especially as moms, are dictated by those school schedules. They yeah. are. Yeah. Like we plan everything around them. Like, oh, I mean, I, in yeah. the afternoon alone, just trying to coordinate picking up two kids from two different schools and still working in between there, it is a full time oh. job. And don't like, even get me started if your kids go to different school districts or different school systems for whatever <laughs> reason. Like, remember yeah. when you had um, one that had the middle school, high school schedule and the other one that had the elementary schedule? They had different oh, yeah. days off. Yeah. Like, oh, well, my goodness. Like, yes. And it happened. District just different days off. <laughs> so all of the, all of these schedule shifts happen and like us having teenagers, we definitely see the impact of teen sleep on their behavior and their moods and how pushing the school start time and letting them sleep in a little bit later is definitely a huge help to them because I love in your book, how you really go into all of the details. First of all, about what really occurs in the teenage brain during sleep. Could you tell us a little bit about that and why teenagers, it's really important that they get that recommended eight to 10 hours? Yes, and it is so important right, for us and also just in general to refocus the conversation back on the fact that this is a public health issue because otherwise mm -hmm. it does get yeah. derailed by these other things like transportation, which are real, yeah. but mm -hmm. are solvable. But yes. the mm -hmm. whole reason why these healthy school start times are what's recommended is because our teens are chronically sleep deprived otherwise. And having these later start times is the single biggest policy change we can make to help them get enough sleep. And when they don't get enough sleep, there are implications across the board. So let me just talk quickly about those and then we can talk yeah. about the, the brain. But basically, nobody does anything better as a result of being sleep deprived. So I'll just put that out there. I mean, adults too. Agreed. But our, yeah. So, but our teens are supposed to be getting eight to 10 hours for optimal functioning. So few of them are getting that amount. CDC did a survey in 2019, only about 22% uh, of teens were even hitting the minimum of eight hours. So just to give you a sense of how widespread mm -hmm. this is. But what that means is they're tired in class, some of them are literally falling asleep at their desks. I mean, I talked to teachers where, you know, clearly if a kid is fast asleep, they are not learning. <laughs> no. Yeah. But even if they're awake, you know, but they're sleepy, they're not retaining the information nearly as well as they would. So teens who are sleep deprived, it affects their school performance. It affects attendance and tardies and graduation rates. It affects risky behaviors, which go up when, when teens are sleep deprived. Could we, so, could we talk about that really fast? The risky behaviors thing, yes. because there is, um, uh, there is something big lying in that. And I read it in your book too, specifically here in our school district, we have had a string of teen suicides in high school oh. and it has hit the community hard, but what I find interesting reading was that there is actually a correlation in lack of sleep with suicide attempts. Can you yeah. address that really quickly? Yeah. And first of all, that is heartbreaking to hear mm -hmm. about the suicide cluster. We had that in our district too, actually, my son's freshman year. And obviously suicide is such a complex topic, but sleep or lack of sleep absolutely does play into it because when you're sleep deprived, it does exacerbate mental health issues, including yeah. depression, anxiety, and suicidality. So there, there is what they call a dose response relationship, meaning that the less sleep teens get, the more their suicide risk goes up, uh, yeah. which is and, terrifying to hear and, as a parent. And reading the research on that, that you presented really made sense in my brain. It was that it takes less time from them to go from idea to action. Is that correct? When the brain doesn't have enough sleep? Yes, because um, wow. sleep deprivation heightens impulsivity, impulsive behaviors, which unfortunately can play into, you know, suicide attempts. Teens already 
are more prone to risky behaviors and impulsivity just because of the stage of brain development that they're at, because mm -hmm. their brains are not fully developed. There's a, you know, we see what's happening on the outside, the physical transformation, but there's also major brain development happening kind of, you know, under the hood. It's called essentially pruning and connectivity. There's pruning mm -hmm. away of the unused brain cells so that the ones that are left can function more efficiently. But then there's also connectivity between the brain cells and between the brain regions. One of the neuroscientists I spoke to about this likens this connectivity phase to upgrading from a dirt road to a paved highway. That's pretty but accurate. Just, but this other key piece, the connectivity between brain regions, because there's the, you know, the section responsible for impulsivity, but then there's the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for executive functioning and, you know, mm -hmm. this rational thinking. Well, that gets upgraded later. And so the teens have this heightened Im impulsivity and the, the, the braking system sort of lags behind. That's probably the best way to explain it. So they're yeah. already prone to this. And then you layer in sleep deprivation and you can see why it's even more yeah. dangerous. Well, so, let's, yeah, I, well, I was going to say, like, let's just acknowledge that sleep deprivation is a big deal. I mean, it's considered a form of torture. So it you is. Know, I mean, it is. And now that we've kind of we've established, like, how important it is for teens to get sleep. So parents, if you're listening right now, like, don't don't be frightened because there is stuff that we could do as yeah. parents to help our teens get more sleep. One of the things that you suggest is about screen usage. Can you go a little bit into that? Yeah. Well, tech use is such a huge topic because it's complicated. I mean, tech is not bad. We can't just sort of vilify tech. And as much as, you know, it might be nice to say, oh, in the good old days, you know, we didn't have that, you know, and I know certainly I, I'm not sure that I'm better off for having all these instantaneous, you know, news alerts in my life, but it's here. You know, I mean, this, this is part of our lives. And for our kids who are digital natives, it's much more a part of their lives. So, so for tech, I think one thing to underscore is that it is something that is necessary for them just as part of their schoolwork to begin with. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like when I was mm -hmm. in school, you know, turning in a handwritten book apart, like that right. does not fly anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to be online to do their homework, you know, to yep. turn in assignments. So Thank you, tech is not going anywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not. <laughs> so, you know, so they're online, they have to be for homework and things like that. But then they also use tech as part of their social life, as part mm -hmm. of their kind of being able to decompress, you know, which obviously they do need time for that tech is a valid part of their social lives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do have to acknowledge that, but at the same time, it can be overwhelming because it was designed to be that way, you know, that it feeds into, you know, t t uh, teens are much more prime to risk-taking, as I mentioned, but also reward-seeking. So this is like what we're up against, mm -hmm. I think that you can't just take tech away entirely. How do you live with it and how do you kind of set best practices? So the best practice is, Ideally, no tech use an hour before bedtime. Those mm -hmm. are the official recommendations. Ideally, you want to have tech devices out of the bedrooms at night. So that would mean charging them in a central location, like the kitchen, <laughs> but even things like phones. You know, maybe they're on their computer to do their homework, but if phones can be charged in the kitchen. But then here's the thing. This is where having it be a family practice, not just a teen. I want you mm -hmm. to do this because, I mean, as you know, that doesn't generally go over really well with your teen. No. <laughs> I, no. Like you, I like how you said that. Generally, that doesn't go over well. Teens are uh, quick to call yeah. you out on everything that you do that it's does like, not follow what you say. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what no, you we, see in my house. <laughs> oh, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much the hissing cat. That is a perfect, yeah. perfect analogy. So, and let's face it, we should not have be on our devices late at night either. It's not good for sleep. But here's the interesting thing when I talk to the sleep scientists about this. So there are three ways that it impacts our sleep. And, and one of them, which I know, you know, we all hear about is blue light, right? The yeah. Mm -hmm. these devices. Well, here's the thing. Blue light it, it does play an alerting function. I mean, that's the, the part of the spectrum that makes us feel more alert. So that's real. But it was, of the three, the least impactful, which I thought was super interesting. So the other two are the fact that when you're on your device, you are literally taking away from your sleep time. You know, if you're up until 2 a.m. playing video games, mm -hmm. you're cutting into your sleep time. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the third reason, which, you know, is, is really huge when you think about it, 
what you're doing generally when you're on your device is stimulating and engaging. So mm-hmm. you're revving up your brain. That is so interesting because I only hear the blue light reason, but you're totally right with the stimulation that occurs with online devices right before bed and how that could really have an impact on the sleep. And it's so funny because I was just, after listening to your audiobook yesterday to prepare, I read that about teens and sleep and I went to go kiss my daughter goodnight and she was here like doing her assignment on her computer while having like a YouTube thing playing in the background. I'm like, I just read this thing <laughs> and here's everything that's going through my brain. And she just kind of like, yeah, Bob, okay. <laughs> Believe me, I mean, as I was researching this and writing it, and I would, you know, tell my my kids about it, they were not always like, oh, gee, mom, that's super interesting. (laughs) Wait, did you ever get an OG mom that's super interesting? Because if so, you need to bottle that and share it with the rest of us so that we can figure out how to get our kids to say that. (laughs) There were were a couple. So there was one point where my daughter had these sort of, I think they're called like fairy lights, those little lights that are strung up around Mm -hmm. the ceiling, Uh and you can change the color of them. And Mm, so I did talk to her about the colors of light and the fact that blue was not the best color to have in the evening because blue is more of an alerting color and that the calmer colors would be on the other side of the spectrum, more of like the pinks and the oranges. So she did listen because that was an easy one. Like, oh, I'll just click the button, you know? Yeah, that's that's an easy one to do. And, but the rest of it, I would say sometimes it's just a slow uh, process that it's Mm -hmm. having these conversations and it's Mm -hmm. showing our teens that we make sleep a priority in our lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, So another tip for parents is to encourage your teen to develop a wind down routine. Mm -hmm. And this is something where we can also be modeling that. I love the idea of a wind down routine too, because something that doesn't include devices, something that isn't stimulating. Well, and if you think about it, you were probably doing it with your kids when they were little. I mean, a lot of us have bath, book, bed. Mm -hmm. Like, so like you were doing things to help wind down anyways. It's just a matter of continuing on that good habit and not not ditching it so early. And really doing it yourself too. Like my wine down routine is reading a book. Yeah, I'm the same way. I prefer not to read on a Kindle if possible. So I, it's an actual book that I read. And Mm -hmm. Brie, your, your point about bath, book, bed, like that's perfect. And of course the key is we don't have to be doing it for them anymore. Thank goodness. Right. Yes. (laughs) Yep. It's whatever works for you. One of the great suggestions that one of the sleep specialists shared with me was even listening to a podcast can be great. And that can help be kind of a soothing part. But that whole point of a transition time of things that are Mm -hmm. more soothing, because we're not computers. You can't just like run hard and then boop, switch the, you know, switch off. I know, right? (laughs) It's very, very true. I love these tips that you gave parents too about how to improve teen sleep, how to encourage teens to get more sleep. And it's just been a joy having you. Everyone should go out and get your book. Go out and get her book. (laughs) It is a sleep deprived teen. And what is exciting that's coming up for you, Lisa? What are you excited about? Well, I am still really immersed in sleep, I have to say, because right now we are the only state that has passed a law. So there are still many, many states out there that, and I believe that state legislation ultimately is the best way to have this happen at scale, because Mm -hmm. there are communities around the country that have done this, but up till now it's been on a patchwork basis. So Mm -hmm. I'm continuing to really get out there and advocate for this. The exciting thing is that there are a couple of states right now, including New York and New Jersey, that have bills in the works on this, which is awesome. But also working with other communities that that want to do this. I mean, as you said, going out and advocating, you know, I am all for that. And that's what I did. I started in my local community and that as parents, we can do that. And you can get out there and start talking with other parents form a group of Start School Later, or even bring in a speaker, have a PTA session about sleep, you know, to help people understand and just to to continue having these conversations. So I'm all about the parent advocacy and, and I am rooting for you and I will help you in any way I can with your, with your own district. <laughs> oh my gosh. We, we, we might yes. be reaching out because Arizona is a tough cookie. Yeah. We're next door. We're, cookie, yeah. we're close. We're close. It might be a hard sell because we're kind of a cowboy state, but you know, <laughs> well, we are next door. Everybody <laughs> needs sleep, including cowboys. Yeah. That is a keeper. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Lisa, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me. That conversation with Lisa, I mean, both of us said when we stopped it, we could have continued it for hours. I know, right? Because I, I feel like it's it's obvious information. And we didn't talk about it in the episode, but you had read in her book about 
studies that were done in the 70s. The 70s, this. the 70s, where they noticed that teens needed more sleep than preteens did because of this like essential brain processes. And it's crazy. And we were talking off air too, how changing school start times is such an easy thing to do. Yeah. Like there's no, like we, there is a mental health group here in Phoenix. Uh, it's a group of parents aimed to improve the mental health of teens. Mm -hmm. And there's all these talks about interventions and programs that the schools could be doing and everything. Whereas when the mention of a school start time moving, which is such a simple thing to do, like in practice, you don't have any guesswork. It is immediately pushed back on as that won't work. Sports, bus schedules, bam, bam, bam. I think it's just a lot of people that possibly have that same mentality as me of the whole, like, I just, I, I'm comfortable with my routines and I don't like changing them, but that's when you need to be able to, to look at it. Like we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Here's a solution that doesn't cost any money. Will it be uncomfortable? And the first little while of it and first little while could be a year, two years, whatever, could be two months. It just depends. Mm -hmm. Will it be uncomfortable? Yes. But will it help um, our youth have a, have better mental health, which is in a detrimental state right now? Yeah. Due to so many things. So many things. That are out of our control. This is something that is in our control that we can do. And it's a public health issue. It is not an issue of better routines or like yeah. anything like that. I read a quote recently that stuck with me that this generation of kids is the most overparented and underprotected of any generation because a lot of the policies we're doing as adults aren't looking to protect them. Things about saving the environment, oh, right. things we could do where we know the research on sleep and we're not taking action to change the school start times. Right. Like little things and major things that we could do right now to protect our kids and it's not happening. And I see it and you get so mad as a parent and you're like, what can I do? And this is really something simple you could do. Like I was talking with Lisa after, and I think I'm going to start a book study like on our Facebook group for, uh, for the high book? school, for her high for school. The, for the sleep deprived Yeah, school? for Lisa's book yeah. because she has so much great information. And I totally believe if people were aware of the actual data out there on the importance of sleep, that minds would start shifting and being like, yeah, this is something that we need to do. Right. Because it, it, part of it too, is just having other people agree that it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Then, then there's more people, more minds there to help problem solve. So, I mean, yeah. it's, so hopefully you heard this episode and it, it intrigued you one way or another. It either made you go, that is really stupid. Or it made you say, this is an amazing idea. Either way, Ooh. Go read the book. <laughs> Wait, that is really stupid? This well, I mean, some people, uh, there's some people that are going to probably say like, uh, that's dumb. My kid gets enough sleep is totally fine. Or or if you're, okay, there's going to be some pushback on push this. Pushback, pushback. Um, if you don't have a teenager yet, you might think it's as easy as just telling your kid to go to bed. Yes. Um, you might think it's as easy as just having this be your house rules. And it isn't. There's there's outside factors. Like I mentioned on there real briefly that my son has a 6.30 start time. That's because he goes to what's called zero hour in our district, mm -hmm. which he has to do if he wants to be in marching band, which... It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Just, it's like there's, there, there really was no choice in that matter. So again, I, I feel like there's some people are going to be like, well, this is just silly. All you have to do is just control your kid's bedtime. And it, it's, it's not. It really is a lot more than that. And then knowing the, the science behind it, what the research says about how it directly impacts our kids. And also how you're fighting biology because teens start producing that melatonin later in the day as their circadian rhythm shifts. Like it's a biological fact. I'm like, just go read some of the research. Or if you don't want to do that, which I totally get, listen to this podcast again and again. I'm Share this podcast. Share, Share the podcast. The podcast. Others, read the book, The Sleep Deprived Teen. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of the No Guilt Mom podcast. Come and see us on YouTube. YouTube, leave us a comment there. We can chat with you directly there. Yeah. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Leave us a review of the podcast as well. Go subscribe on YouTube. Go subscribe to the <laughs> podcast. We have so many asks of you on how you can keep and show your love for the No Get Mom podcast because we really, really want to help make your life easier. We want to be here to make you laugh and uh, just come up with more episodes for you so yeah. you're not so alone in this world of parenting. So until next time, remember that the best mom is a happy mom. Take care of you and we'll talk to you later. Thanks for stopping by.